Thank you, Mr. Mark. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so as Jean Marc said, I'm a social worker and uh, um, teaching social work here in Britain, I find it uh, that I want to uh, move to work on things related more to here. Some of my colleagues look at me and they think, well, you know, it's not fine if you were an anthropologist or a, you know, a scholar in Israel studies, but you, you teach social work, so come on. Um, but somehow I, despite well, this project was somehow, if you remember the last breath, I thought I'll bang a very quick article which I thought would be great, and it happened, uh, the initial idea was about five years ago or something, and, uh, and somehow I just can't, um, it doesn't go as I wanted it to go. I wanted to finish this project, but it keeps sort of emerging and developing, and I, there's something in me that tells me that it's important. So, this is what it is, I'm still with it, and Thanks to, uh, when, when Jean-Marc uh, invited me, I was just about, uh, several publications about this topic that just came out, and I thought, well, I can maybe summarize my work. But I, when I started preparing for the lecture, I thought to myself, God, this is not going to be very interesting for myself, just to you know, regurgitate the whole thing again. So, and I really wanted to add something, so, took some time and looked at the materials that I uh, gathered. And some of the materials I thought were very interesting, but I didn't ever have enough time to look at them. And this is what I did. And I think I came up with something that I find interesting. Um, so as part of collecting endless amounts of materials, I came across two books um, that were written from a religious point of view by people who oppose such relations and uh, they are based on real stories of women who were in such relations um, and somehow were rescued or survived. This is the terminology. Okay, so I'll, and I'll, I'll talk more about these books and what I'm hoping to, to be able to learn through them. But let's start. Um, so this will be the outline of my talk. I'll talk a little bit about the context, some of the previous research, and, and then these religious interpretations and representations of these relations. Um, some of you might know, um, so Israeli society, well, as any other society, is going through change, but um, the change that I'm talking about is the demographic growth of the more religiously oriented parts in Israeli Jewish society, um, and the general trend that seems like an increased religiosity, my point of view, uh, perspective. Um, a growing Israeli Arab population and more interaction with Jews uh, in, in different spheres, and we all are aware of those waves of immigration, immigration from Ethiopia and uh, the USSR. Um, and they are important, and I'll, I'll talk more about it in, in a few minutes. And as a result, there is a potential for more such relationships, more interaction, more relationships. Um, and in recent years, uh, for quite a while now, a, a very intense public debate about these uh, relations. 
Jean-Marc, you asked me about the numbers. So um, we know very little about the numbers um, for a variety of reasons. Um, we know that there are not many such relations. Um, we know that there are um, about 5% of married couples in Israel that are mixed. But most of these mixed couples are couples in which um, one partner is considered to be non-Jewish according to uh, halakhic uh, law, but is Jewish enough to be uh, um, to be uh, given the right of return. So many of them are immigrants. And there are here and there very sporadic uh, numbers, um, like these 70 women converted to Islam. Um, I find it really difficult. And there were several um, recent uh, um, news uh, releases by different religious organizations supposedly based on the uh, Israeli um, Statistical Bureau, which I checked with the Statistical Bureau and it turned out to be false. So, there's, we know very little. Now, as you might understand, I'm interested in the barriers and how those who oppose these relationships, what is happening there. So, from reading, um, well, not just about the Israeli case, but uh, you know, there are many uh, other countries in which those interfaith, interracial relations were looked at in a very suspicious way. So the South African and the American case, or the, um, hopefully I'm pronouncing it right, the miscegenation. Uh, so, um, in all of those places, the legal system is the first barrier against such relations. Uh, in Israel, there's no law that forbids such relationships. Uh, and therefore, the obstacles are very subtle. There is no mechanism that will allow such marriages to take place. Um, you can go abroad if you have some money and, and conduct your marriage there and come back and usually the state will acknowledge your marriage. Um, okay. So that's the first uh, barrier, the legal system. Um, in one of those articles that I published, I, which was based on uh, discussions in the Israeli parliament, in different uh, parliamentary committees, I showed how um, in different committees there were discussions about how can we uh, create barriers to these relationships uh, through the legal system. So can we do anything? Can the police do anything to prevent these relations? Can the, the Ministry of Education do anything to prevent these relations? Can we teach students that these relations are problematic? We can't, but we can ban the books of Dorit Rabinian, whose picture was at the front of my presentation. That's probably oh, the, the maximum that we can do. We can't actually, if we want to still be considered as a democracy, uh, we can't really teach against these relations. So there is a really fine balance. We, we want to be perceived and, and see ourselves as a democracy, but we don't want these relations. At least many people don't want these relations. Uh, it, well, these, uh, some of these parliamentary committees are fascinating reading materials. Um, okay, so um, in terms of, of what you can do legally, there are 
real problem. You can't do much. Often local municipalities use um, all sorts of rules and regulations uh, that are applied uh, in a discriminatory way against Arabs. For example, that you can't, laws like you can't uh, uh, make a lot of noise in late hours, you can't uh, uh, gather, create gatherings in, in certain areas from certain hours, or you know, all sorts of rules that you can apply for in, in discriminatory way. But you can't do much more than that. So there is the other barrier in which another article, uh, and as a social worker, I was especially fascinated by, and I'm hoping to, to study much more directly. I still couldn't find, uh, couldn't manage to get funding for, but uh, um, I found it especially fascinating to understand uh, the f mind frame of secular, most often liberal social workers in Israel who observe these relationships in a very, very negative way um, and interfere as not just in the Israeli case, but as in many other places, often people from weaker socioeconomic backgrounds are a much easier target and the state often uses much more power uh, to, to interfere. So it's much more difficult to, to apply such interventions on people from a stronger background. Um, and what you find is that, um, especially when the parents are um, against such relationships, um, the, these, some of these young girls are um, even um, sectioned in, in psychiatric institutions. I don't know if you heard of Mesila and Sophia. Um, there are, well, and, and there are certainly um, cases, and I spoke with many people involved, in which this is a, cre a key criteria. Um, but this is a different talk. If you're interested in that, I'm, I'm just trying to give you the background. And I'm, I think it's fascinating, and uh, it should be studied much more. Um, okay, but uh, and the additional way to try and, and prevent and uh, work against such relations or minimize the occurrence is through uh, discourse and representation. Um, since you can't teach people uh, at schools, you can't go into schools, especially not. Uh, the secular state school it might be more, uh, probably a bit more possible in, in the more religious streams. But uh, so um, often alternative media is the source where you can reach a wider audience. Um, so you have. Uh, range of websites and, and uh, um, news outlets that uh, just give a lot of information about those things. And here I thought, just to give you a little taste, uh, it's not going to take a lot of time, and uh, you can hear this.
Okay, so um, such films became uh, a very common thing to see on Israeli television, and uh, and they are the same kind of uh, nature, uh, abusive relationship. Um, a mother who is a survivor and being rescued. Um, and it's very important to say, I'm sure, that um, some of these relations can go really awfully wrong. But um, so as many other kinds of relationships, not just between people from different uh, um, religions. Um, but what you will see is just these kinds of relations, as if necessarily this is what happens when people from these two religions decide to see their faith together. Um, okay, moving on. So, I have in my title The Moral Panic Thing. I wrote about it quite a lot. I don't want to talk about it more now because I want to move on. I can maybe go back to it in, in later on. Um, so this is what I want to talk about. So these are the two books and these are sort of posters uh, from two recent theater productions. Um, this is from the two sides of the border and to the end of the world. Both similar stories all based on what they call research uh, and true stories. Um, and they attempt to or, 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 uh, address a similar audience in a way. These uh, shows are just uh, for women. It's a theatre just that only women can come and uh, watch it. But I'll talk about these books. So, um, first one, now this first one is this one published in 1995, and the second one in uh, 2013. As I said, religious narratives based on what they call real cases and told from the point of view of the women. Now, th this is where I, I'm I want to try to explain why I think it's interesting. It's interesting because um, the, we need to understand that the majority of women in these relations come from non-religious homes um, and that young people in Israel are exposed to this human rights and equality discourse and this is evident in the books because the books um, re um, recreate a discussion supposedly that supposedly took place between these young women and, for example, the family members who re, who, resi, who rejected the idea of such relationship. So the father criticized the, his daughter, and she says, "Hey, wh why do you why do you think it will be so bad? What what are these racist ideas? You know, we are human beings. So there is a whole discussion that is recreated here, and." Um, now, to be effective, these supposed narratives suppo are meant to create a story that um, will have a very clear conclusion. And the conclusion should be that all such relations um, should be avoided. Why? Because it is written by people who, from the start, resist and see these relations in a very, very negative way. But in order to create a story that will, readers will read and uh, read the book and will say, God, it makes sense. I can believe the narrative. I can see that this might be a real way things develop in these relationships. The story needs to be convincing, right? Can't be a crazy story that pe readers will say, "This is these are not human beings." It must make sense. It must read as a story that we can believe it. 
as if something that really happened. Um, and if the conclusion that the authors would like to, the readers to have is that it's not just this particular case, this particular couple didn't work out for them. Okay, but it will be work out for me, you know? Why, why should I make any conclusions out of, you know, what happened to so and so and so and so and, and myself? I don't need to make it. Oh, we're different people. In order to make such a, such a conclusion, you need to convince the readers that it's not just one case, it's not two cases, it's many cases, it's all of those cases. There are inherently, there is something there that no matter who you are as a Jew, and who the other person, it will always go wrong. This is what should be the conclusion. But how do you tell such a story without being racist? This is what I think is interesting, and I'll try to tell you how they're doing it, because this is what they're doing. Um, so, this is a little bit, the, you know, like all relationships. It's, it's how, how does it start and what happens from there on. So, starting from how these books portray the, the Arab partner. Um, so he can be someone who works at the greengrocer, uh, local supermarket, um, a passerby, they might meet while clubbing, um, he often has a foreign name. Um, he's very generous at the beginning, helpful, kind. This is always it, like portrayed in a very sort of uh, suspicious way, gentle suspicion. Um, and they meet in a Jewish-dominated area. She, on the other hand, the Jewish woman. Um, she is younger, a teenager. Um, a lot of her behavior is portrayed as sort of motivated by some kind of rebellious tendencies. She, you know, it's, she's very emotional. She, 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 all her interactions with, with the uh, like more uh, mature adults are she is the, the, the emotional side, and they are the more rational. Um, and she's led by what religious people see as very sort of earthly inclinations. You know, she likes, she likes food, she likes beautiful clothes, she likes nice cars, and you know, she, and those things that probably she shouldn't. Um, so, the Arab partner is an excellent Sufi, yes. Um, he knows to do all of those things better even than Jewish men. So he's, he's, so, he's, so, he's so charismatic and, and something there really appeals to her. Uh, she, on the other hand, is lonely, vulnerable, in a time of need, she is. She has a big row with her mother. She is. Um, she is a lonely um, child. She is. I don't know all sorts of things. Um, marriage often very quickly, um, and. Uh, in both cases, um, it seems like the marriage is not very welcomed by both families. Um, and both partners, at this stage at least, put, are portrayed as if they need to make quite a lot of effort against their family. So they are uh, non-conformists, both of them, in that, res in that respect. Um, then, uh, the couple move into always it's an Arab village. From city, from the cultured city, they move into the village, um, living in in this communal, uh, traditional setting. 
uh, with, with the husband's family. And since it's the husband's setting and, and culture and community, she needs to adjust. And um, this adjustment is quite difficult. Um, and they are very intolerant, which could happen. You know, we could happen. Um, but she is, in all of these stories, portrayed and perceived, portrayed as perceived by his family to be lazy and spoiled and. Um, and they're very critical and angry with her. So it's a whole culture, it's a whole setting. Um, now, once this dynamics start, starts, um, he very quickly becomes a totally different person. Now, I'll, I'll try to read uh, some sort of quotes and sections a little bit to give you a flavor in a minute. Uh, he very quickly becomes a different person. While he was this rebellious person before uh, they got married or up to, the, to marriage, once uh, they move into the, the family, uh, the wider family, um, he, in a way, loses any ability to resist. He has no agency, suddenly. And he becomes completely passive, as if all of this anger is forced upon him. It's not, it's not that he, his madness. It's a, wider, it's a wider force that makes him. It's so embedded in the, in the social dynamics that it's not his. It's not this psychological crazy guy. He, it's, it's not. It's some some wider uh, uh, cultural and social forces that forces him into this place, um, and he becomes extremely violent to her. So. Either it's the family that becomes extremely violent and he can't protect her, or he himself becomes the tool of the, uh, the anger that comes from the family, and he then becomes very uh, violent. And even if there are a few cases where the relationship is portrayed as very positive, surprisingly, and there's no violence, towards her, then she discovers soon after that, in fact, this partner of her is extremely violent, but so far not towards her. So one of those cases, he just murdered his cousin a minute ago. <laughs> so because they are all so inherently violent. Now, in some, I said they are, they're all villagers, of course. Uh, in some of those cases, there is a case that I'll read to you in a minute. Uh, he is a city person. Um, and uh, in, later on, after this woman was rescued, she uh, confesses. She has, she, have a, she has a discussion with some friends, other women who uh, survived. And she said, I knew that he was an Arab, but he was a city man. I thought he was much more cultured. But no, they are all just the same. It's this inherent violent uh, tendency that no, they, they can't escape it. Um, so, the case that I have a few more, um, a few more moments, and I, I'm getting closer to the end. So, this is uh, one of those cases. So Michelle and Mika, this is how uh, they are introduced at the beginning. And um, so she is a French immigrant, a young woman who came to serve in the Israeli army. And as many other immigrants, she's quite lonely. Her family is back in France. Uh, 
while other soldiers go home on Fridays, she doesn't have a family to go to, so she goes to the mar uh, Carmel market. You know, it's lively, it's sort of vibrant. And then there is one of the merchants, Yosef, who um, somehow develop a relationship with her, um, and somehow he learns where she's, where her base is, and one day he comes and surprises her with a beautiful gift, a wonderful fruit basket, and uh, then he asks her if, if she would agree to tutor his cousin, who is a banker, uh, who, and uh, his cousin studies French and is looking for a tutor, and he's willing to pay, so she says, Yes, fine, but I will not charge money because I'm not a teacher. So she starts uh, teaching for uh, his cousin, Micha. And, um, and this is, uh, well, these are some quotes. Um, so something is happening, something positive. He was a very... Um, arduous scholar of French and became very good at it. But gradually, um, there, there are some gifts. Um, and they always, when they write about those gifts, they write about it in a very sort of suspicious way. That, you know, she, he buys her. Um, but um, she seemed to be uh, very impressed and attracted to him. Um, and he, well, so, uh, I shouldn't, I don't want to read them, but um, a positive relationship develops. And uh, I'll try to, sh there's a bit more here. Um, she agrees to marry him. Um, there is one thing, his name is not Micha, but Mahmoud. Um, she's very insulted, but she has a whole rationale. People are people, I, I love the human in him. I can understand that he wanted, that he is afraid of racism and he uh, and he allows her, he said, well, you know, I will totally understand if you'll decide that you don't want to be in a relationship with me now. And she says, okay, I need to think about it. She goes away and she decides that it's not, it's not that important. She can understand and she decides to go on in the relationship and they move on, they get married. Um, he also says, uh, I'm interested, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I love Judaism, I want to learn more uh, sort of look into the process. I want I want to convert, and she's fine. Um, so they fall in love, and they get married. Um, for the first three years, they seem to live very happily away from the family, and they have autonomy, and they can do whatever they want. A lot of understanding and seem to be very peaceful. Um, his plan, well, you know, they, they have children, he progresses very well in the bank, becomes really important, and uh, keeps studying, but, you know, converting is a really complicated process, and gradually it becomes less important, or less viable, and less important also for her. Um, she trusted, she trusts him, and um, it's not a big deal. He's, for her, he's a human being. This is what is important, and he respects her, and they get along very well, and it's all going smoothingly well. But then, after three years, the family, this family, this tribe of his, this something that was hidden, that was lurking, is sort of emerging gradually, and they force him, they force the couple they, to move in with them. They're very wealthy, so they built uh, uh, like a whole apartment building, and uh, each brother has uh, his own flat, and so on. 
So, but they have to move. Um, and, um, but very quickly, she finds it really difficult. She's portrayed, she's perceived to be lazy, this Jewish princess. And, uh, these are the options. You have to show everyone that you are quick, clever, submissive, happy and patient. And if you will be clever and do all of these things, they will love you. If you continue to behave like you do now, I don't envy you. And she says, but I'm French, I'm different. You like me so far, how come, what happened? You know, and he says, no, how do you know that I liked you? I, I hope that you'll change, but you never learn somehow. You know, you, nothing happens, you know. I was hoping you will learn, but now it's your time. And she thinks to herself, they never argued before. It was all so beautiful and, and calm. But now that they moved into this family, this is they are there is a, this tribal law, this social forces that are stronger than the both of them. It's a new dynamic, and um, and this in a way makes sense. It's not racist, right? It's not racist. It is, but it's much more sophisticated. I'll get to it in a minute. So, and then, what happens is that uh, the father, his father, Mahmoud fa Mahmoud's father, is especially against these relations because, in his mind, Mahmoud should have got married with someone who was destined for him, an Arab woman, and he's very angry, and he's also very. He disliked this Jewish woman who was different and, and lazy and so on. So, in one of the scenes, uh, he bring he demands uh, Mahmoud to summon his wife to the family living room, and uh, and he starts by um, criticizing her, humiliating her in front of all the family, and then actually um, hitting her. And the whole family joins, like a, you know, a, a lynch. Almost they, they all lynch her. They kick her. They and uh, and he is there, the husband, joining. And and after that, he comes to her. Where he, she was rescued from there after she was badly beaten by one of the women and. He says to her, my soul, forgive me. I didn't know that my father is angry with you. What could I have done? If I would protect you, my honor would be trampled. So, and this, this kind of dynamics repeats itself. So, there are wider forces, much wider forces. Uh, once you, you get into this community, into this culture, this is a violent culture in which women's roles is very different from what it is in, in the Jewish world, or as if, and, um, and the husband just completely loses any agency, any ability to protect his wife, to, to work against the community, um, and this repeats itself in all the cases. There can't be anything else. There is no other dynamics in, these, um, in, in, in this kind of society, because it's so different from ours, now, the authors are very clever. They don't use the word difference. They talk about separateness. No difference. Um, how much more time do I have? Not much to end with. Well, just because of the Holocaust, I thought 
uh, we, we spoke about, there is an interesting, um, there is an interesting section here where, um, well, after they get married um, and they have kids, uh, they then travel together to France to meet the parents of the bride, which they never did before. And uh, the parents are very, um, well, the mother is much more apprehensive. Uh, and she's apprehensive, and then she uh, tells the daughter something she never told her before. She tells her that um, she and her husband, so Michelle's father, are both uh, hobo survivors. It's a bit strange if you think about the years, but it doesn't matter, but they are Holocaust survivors. <laughs> yeah? They are Holocaust survivors and, and this connection to the Holocaust. The Holocaust is, um, you know, once you... So her, her final sentences are once you bring, once you decide to join your destiny with people from other religions, you bring the Holocaust upon yourself. So that's, that's the connection. Um, now, I think this kind of narratives and, and ideas that I'll, I'll have some academic backing in Israel. There is a fascinating lecture by Mordechai Kedar, and I'm happy to send you the link because I think it's fascinating that that uh, the you know experts of the Middle East can can still talk about society in such terms. So he gave a fascinating lecture just a few years ago. Um, at this conference, uh, Violence Against Women on the Background of National Conflict. And um, this was the opening lecture of this conference. And um, in this lecture, he gives a very sort of uh, lengthy review of cases of violence in the Arab world. Um, and the basic argument is that in all of those many societies that he reviews there, there is this very basic and, and st static tendency, very violent static tendency uh, that uh, is much more... Um, ancient and prior to Islam. And Islam itself tried to eradicate these, these very violent tendencies, but because it's so basic and so embedded, even Islam, hundreds of years of Islam couldn't change it. This is something that will never change. It's always there and it's everywhere. Um, now, this kind of what I call cultural essentialism, I'm sure you are familiar with the term, um, but the basic idea that certain tendencies, in this case very negative tendencies, are embedded not in the biology of a group of people, but in their culture. Um, and they just uh, fixed across time and place. So, this is sort of where I'm at. Um, I'm not, I'm still thinking about it, what, what exactly to do with, with, uh, with these stories, but um, so I would be very happy to hear any ideas about how to, I, I feel, often I feel that some psychoanalytic explanations might be relevant here or um, well, I'll stop here and I would love to hear your thoughts and comments and